Our third witness is Lord Christopher Monckton. He is Chief Policy Advisor for the Science and Public Policy Institute. He holds a diploma in journalism from the University College Cardiff. He has worked as an editor at various news outlets, including The Universe, The Telegraph, Sunday Magazine. Uh, today, uh, news, uh, today, newspaper and the Evening Standard. From 1982 to 1986, he was an advisor to UK Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher and gave policy advice on a variety of issues. He is a founder and director of Christopher Monckton Limited, which consults in public administration. We welcome you, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Mr. Chairman, sir, and uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, it's a pleasure to see you both again and also many other faces on your committee. Thank you for having the courtesy to ask me to testify in front of you. Uh, I'm going to testify not, of course, as a scientist, because I'm not one, but as a policymaker. And the role of policymakers when confronted with scientists is to know what questions to ask. And I'm going to raise uh, one or two questions now about some of the evidence you've already heard. If you look at the slide uh, now before you, that slide purports but does not demonstrate that the rate of global warming is itself increasing. This is taken from the IPCC's 2007 report where it appears three times large and in full color. However, it relies on a bogus statistical technique which is applying multiple trend lines to a single stochastic data set and if you choose your starting and ending points carefully enough, you can make it go in any direction you want. This graph is regularly relied upon by uh, Mr. Pachori of the IPCC. I challenged him on it recently in Copenhagen. It's also relied upon by the EPA. It is defective as I shall now show. Next one please. This graph is the same data, but this time with different trend lines on it. From 1905 to 1945, you will see that the temperature rose faster than from 1905 to 2005. Does this mean that the rate of global warming is slowing down? No, it doesn't. Both this graph and the previous one are bogus, but they're using the same technique on the same data to produce opposite conclusions. That is why the IPCC should not have used that first graph, which has been so heavily relied upon. Let us now see what the true position is. Next slide, please. You will see, in fact, there have been three periods of quite rapid warming over the last 150 years, 1860 to 1880, 1910 to 1940, and 1976 to 2001. Those three rates of warming are exactly parallel, though recently when Senator Vitter questioned uh, Mr. John Holdren about this, he tried to claim that the third rate of increase was greater than the other two. It isn't. They're exactly parallel at roughly 1.6 Celsius per century. Now, we can't explain what caused the first two rapid rates of warming because we don't have the instrumentation to find out. However, in the satellite era, to the right of the green vertical line there, we are able to observe what caused most of the third uh, piece of rapid warming. Next slide, please. And this is from a paper by Dr. Claire Pinker and her colleagues in 2005 showing a very rapid increase in what's called global brightening, the amount of sunlight actually reaching the surface of the Earth. Enough global brightening, in fact, to cause a warming of 1 Celsius degree, though only 0.37 Celsius degrees was observed over that 18-year period. So if anyone tries to tell you that we cannot explain the global warming of the last 30 years, except by reference to carbon dioxide, this graph and many others like it in the scientific literature should suggest otherwise. Next slide, please. And if we now include that data from Dr. Pinker, together with the various forcings and temperature increases from the individual greenhouse gases, we will see that what we end up with is a fourfold overstatement of uh, the rate of increase in global temperature that was actually observed if we use the IPCC's methods to calculate what the warming would have been. A fourfold exaggeration. Next slide, please. Uh, 
And this result is confirmed most recently by Professor Richard Linzen and his colleague Young Sang Choi in a paper published in, two, in, uh, 19, in 2009 and published again this year showing 11 models all predicting various rates of warming from 1.4 to infinity uh, Kelvin if you double CO2 concentration. Next slide please. The reality however is just 0.7 which is less than a quarter of what the UN would predict for a doubling of CO2 concentration. The conclusion from this is that we can explain the warming by other methods. Not very much warming is going to happen and therefore one should be very careful before spending money, next slide please, on cap and trade because even if we were to shut down the entire global economy for 23 years, all you would forestall is one Fahrenheit degree of global warming, even if the UN is right in estimating the amount of warming from CO2. Therefore, the correct policy is to have the courage to do nothing. You will lose nothing thereby. There are many other problems to address. I would recommend you address those and not this. Dr. Gromlich, uh, you were on the Oxborough panel. Were you aware of any of the biases of the other members of this seven-person panel? I believe that the panel was chosen to minimize bias. Well, Lord Oxborough has strong personal and financial interests in anti-global warming policy. Uh, he is director of an international environmental organization called Globe International. He is also chairman of a green energy firm called Falk Renewables and president of the Carbon Capture Storage uh, Association. And there was an article that appeared in the Times of London um, on April 14th uh, where Lord Oxborough himself even told the university that he was unfit to chair the panel because of conflicts of interest and warning the UEA that people might question his independence. If he's a director of an advocacy organization called Globe International, uh, you know, together with the intertwining of, of you and other members, I don't think that this was an objective review. I, I guess I, I'm having these... Um these terms echoing in my ear. Um, I mean, it seems to me that it's a very stark difference. Uh, Dr. Gromlich, you were talking about focusing on the science. Our purpose today uh, was to do precisely that, and I find it a little embarrassing and sad that the minor minority's witness is a journalist with no scientific training who didn't come here with any information against the science. It has been intriguing to me. I've, I've heard Mr. Mockton, um, I've often thought appropriately named, uh, in the past, and it's entertaining, but it doesn't deal very much with the essence of what we're talking about here. I, I, uh, though I suppose I should declare, uh, uh, for the purposes of the record, I had worked with Globe International, uh, so I don't think it has affected my objectivity, nor I did, did I notice any uh, sinister underlying motives uh, or a, an international agenda at work. I guess I have to begin, Dr. Moncton, by uh, expressing a little shock at uh, the questioning that just went forward and some reference to your name. I, I think that's a little inappropriate, uh, but if that's what we're going to do in this hearing, so be it. Um, I do believe you were just told that because you're not a scientist, you didn't bring forward any scientific information or any information of any value to this hearing. Uh, somehow I don't seem to agree with that. I think you brought forth an analysis of scientific information, uh, which I thought was fairly clear. And I guess I'd like to see you at least have an opportunity to repaint that picture, because apparently uh, some people in the room didn't understand that what you said was, uh, here is scientific data. Here is what it, how it was presented. Here is the conclusion that was drawn from that scientific data. And here is why that conclusion is, in fact, unsupported. And apparently that escaped uh, the attention or the understanding of some people here. Is there a possibility we could call that graph back up and you could explain it to us? Maybe so we have the slides again. Maybe please. we can get it the second time. I'm most grateful. I think, that obviously, what is happening here is there's a certain amount of politics has crept in on one side of this debate. What a shock. And uh, <laughs> therefore, 
um, inconvenient science has been dismissed as not being science at all. That is the IPCC's graph with the four separate trend lines on it. That, as I've said, is an inappropriate statistical technique. Next slide. Wait, again. wait, just while Let's we're on back. that one. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the purpose of those lines, this actually appears in the IPCC report. It does three times, yes. A and all the lines slope upward at different angles. That's right. As you get nearer to the present, they slope up at, at steeper and steeper angles. The implication, which is stated three times in the report, being that there is an acceleration of the rate of global warming. No, there isn't, as we see from the subsequent slides. First of all, if you choose different starting points and ending points for where you do your trend lines you can make the lines go completely make the trend going completely the other direction there you've got 1905 to 1945 it was warming at twice the rate of 1905 to 2005 so it's the same it's the exact same data same same data same technique it's a bogus technique of course and that's why you get completely opposite results depending on where you choose to start and end your trend line incorrectly analyzed in the earlier graph to show exactly. a rapid increase in warming. Exactly, and incorrectly analyzed again here. Okay. Next slide, here is the true position where you have the three parallel rapid rates of warming. The first two cannot have been caused by CO2 on any view. The increase in CO2 over those periods wasn't enough even on the UN's formula to cause that. The third one we know was largely caused because it falls in the satellite era, largely caused by a naturally occurring decrease in cloud cover chiefly in the tropics allowing more sunlight to hit the ground and that if you use the UN's multiplying up of the warming effect of that should have caused one Celsius degree or 1.8 Fahrenheit of warming only one only 0.37 uh, Celsius was in fact observed so we now know that that third of the three rapid rates of warming was caused by a natural event almost entirely could, could you clarify something for of course, the panel and for the people in the room listening? What is the satellite era? The satellite era from about 1983 onwards, we had satellites up there not only measuring changes in global surface temperature, which they do by reference to platinum resistance thermometers, comparing that with the temperatures they see on the ground, but also uh, changes in outgoing radiation and changes in cloud cover. And all of these satellite data show us exactly what has caused the warming of that most recent rapid period. And it was largely, in fact, very nearly all, to do with the reduction in cloud cover that happened quite naturally over the period, nothing to do with CO2. Uh, and with regard to, uh, you don't take the position that there has not been warming. There has been warming. You can see it on the graph there. Of course there's been warming. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you got that slightly wrong when you said I didn't say there's been warming. Of course there's been warming. What I'm saying is that in the one period we can tell uh, about what caused the warming, the satellite period, it is clear that the warming was largely naturally caused. And there's paper after paper in the literature establishing this. Go on again, please. Next slide. Um, this is Dr. Pinker's paper establishing that the warming of that period was caused largely by a naturally occurring reduction in cloud cover, extra sunlight reaching the ground. Next slide, please. And, and next one, we'll miss that one out. Uh, we'll go on here to the seven, uh, 11 models, I should say, all predicting very, very rapid rates of um, warming, uh, but uh, this is the relationship between warming at the surface and extra outgoing long wave radiation. Most of the models predict there will be less radiation escaping to space if you warm the surface. The truth, however, as you see in the middle panel now, that's the Earth Radiation Budget Experiment satellite measurement. It shows a very rapid increase in the amount of outgoing radiation escaping to space as you warm the surface. That's very, what that means very simply is that the radiation isn't being trapped down here to cause warming at anything like the rate that the UN predicts. And that's why Professor Lindzen of MIT has concluded that the amount of warming you can expect to get from a doubling of CO2 concentration, this is scientific measurement, not playing with Xbox 360 models, is only 0.7 Kelvin compared with the 3.26 plus or minus 0.69, which is the best estimate of the UN's climate panel. Now, 0.7 Kelvin for a doubling of CO2 concentration is small, harmless, and generally beneficial.
chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. And I would note there is a dispute about whether we actually landed on the moon, and there is a dispute about whether the Earth is round, and there is a dispute about gravity in some places. Uh, but there is no. Sir. We'll get to you, Lord Moncton, shortly. Uh, I was impressed. We're here as the House of Representatives to have the the state of the science discussed about climate change. And I was impressed that those who have denied the threat this poses to the planet Earth couldn't produce one scientist, not one scientist, to propose a hypothesis to explain what the Earth is going, undergoing, all the changes we're undergoing now. They produced somebody it doesn't even have a field, a background in scientists. And that's what they produce to try to convince Americans somehow that this is a big hoax. I think that's impressive or unimpressive depending how you look at it. So I want to ask about Lord Moncton's uh, viewpoint and basis for that. Uh, Lord Moncton, when did you start serving in the House of Lords? I, I noticed you brought fraternal greetings from the Mother of Parliaments to Congress to our athletic democracy. When did you start serving in the House of Lords? Uh, sir, I have never sat or voted in the House of Lords, as you have probably been informed. Thank you. So basically, I want to understand. You had, Lords Act. Thank you. You've answered, you've answered my question. Yes. You come here, you call yourself a Lord to try to convince the world to ignore something that threatens our grandkids. And you're not even a Lord. Now, don't let me finish Sorry, sir, my just question, one then moment. I'll let you speak. Uh, just one moment, sir. No, excuse I me. Am Lord Moncton, you, excuse am me. In our uh, athletic democracy, we'll ask the questions and you'll answer them. Thank you very much. Very well, but uh, you must not mistake, please, sir. Excuse me. You come to our athletic democracy, sir, calling yourself Lord Moncton. Not only I are am. you not a scientist, you're not even a lord who served in the House of Parliament. Isn't that correct? in the House of Lords. Is it correct you did not I serve in the I House of Lords? I think I have already answered that one, yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So we not only have the deniers who have denied this clear science upon which there is enormous global consensus. They cannot only not produce one scientist to deny this clear consensus. They can't even send us a real Lord from the House of Lords. Now, I think that says a lot about the status of this debate, which we should not be having, because we have an overwhelming consensus. The people who work for our athletic democracies have concluded we don't need a fake lord to tell us not to act. We need real science, and we need us to have a clean energy policy. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Lord Mockington, I, I guess... I think you have a, a right to explain why you are a Lord, and I, I don't think you had an opportunity to. I'll do that very briefly, because this is not the subject of this hearing, and once again I see politics of a not particularly pleasant kind creeping in. Um, my grandfather was created a hereditary peer, one of the last to be created, in 1957, and by letters patent issued by the Queen. Until those letters patent are revoked, and they have not been, I remain, and am correctly addressed as, the Viscount Monkton of Brenchley. I am, therefore, a Lord, but by virtue of the 1999 uh, House of Lords Act, I no longer have the right to sit or vote. That was taken away from my father, so I have never sat or voted in the House of Lords, nor have I pretended otherwise. And I think that really should deal with that matter. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, Lord Monkington, um, could what could, what, what could the climate scientists do to regain the public trust in their work? Uh, what can they do to ensure transparency and accountability in the climate scientist community, especially as we look towards the development of the upcoming IPCC's fifth assessment report? Let me first of all begin with the quotation from NOAA's response to my written testimony, which incidentally I wasn't given a copy of before this hearing, and I think somebody has slipped up there. But the, the passage that was quoted focused on one short sentence, which mentioned that for the last seven or eight years there has been, if anything, a certain amount of global cooling. So there has. But however, my temperature record goes back as far as the Neo-Proterozoic era, 750 million years ago. The graphs I showed today are for the last 150 years. 
So I don't think I can be fairly accused of having unreasonably cherry-picked the periods over which I was looking at the data. Now, what I think scientists therefore need to do if they want to start commanding the respect of the public because they are losing that respect over this issue is to stop chattering about consensus. Science has never been done by consensus and it isn't going to be done by consensus now. Stop using in the IPCC's documents references to uh, documents not produced by peer-reviewed sources but by green propaganda groups and by journalists and confine their analysis to the peer-reviewed literature as I did today. And also, they must make sure that instead of trying to push one agenda and shout down anyone who dares to put an alternative point of view, as I have politely sought to do today, they should treat those who disagree with them with courtesy, hear with some care what they have to say, and instead of dismissing an argument they perhaps don't understand, as one of the panelists here did when asked to comment on my testimony, they should instead engage in a rational debate via the columns of the peer-reviewed literature with the many scientists who disagree with the official line. And of course, scientists could have been paraded here today, but quite rightly, the um, minority group, knowing that the majority would merely want to throw brickbats at them, decided that instead somebody with a certain amount of experience in politics and a thick skin should sit and take the cowpats flung at him, which I'm more than happy to do, so as to spare the many thousands of diligent scientists who are questioning every aspect of this ludicrous scare to get on with their work. And that is what in the end is going to decide this matter. It is going to be diligent scientific inquiry and not the hurling of childish political insults. Do, Lord Mocking, do, do some of these scientists, or anyone I guess could answer this question, do some of these scientists, uh, how are they funded? Do they get grants or, or are there organizations that give them funding? Do you think that that has a potential to corrupt the process and what they, their data, and are they, do they feel beholden to certain results because of that? That's a very shrewd point, sir. The only reason why the notion that consensus decides science has unfortunately crept in is that science these days effectively is a monopsony. There's only one paying customer, and that's the unwilling taxpayer. And because of that, and because of the grant funding structure, and because of the resultant academic pressures to conform, it takes enormous courage for any scientist to stand out against the political line that is now being taken among the scientific institutions and to say, hang on a moment, the numbers don't add up. I've just shown you today uh, various points at which the numbers very plainly don't add up. And they are established in the peer-reviewed literature and they're established by measurement and not by modelling. You've heard the rather qualitative replies of the four scientists here. They didn't really quote numbers much. They were quoting models. But science is best done and most accurately done by measurement. And those papers that rely chiefly on measurement are finding that there isn't the problem that we are told there is. Thank you, sir. Uh, we deeply appreciate your coming here. And um, I think any review of, um, of the, the record today, the materials you've submitted, I think uh, illustrates uh, the purpose of the hearing. But we, you've been so patient with us, we want to make sure that, uh, and I apologize for trying to bring it to a conclusion, but we would like to give every uh, member of the panel um, uh, a, a minute, a minute and a half, just to, for any summary conclusion that you may have, any takeaway if you've decided that it was just cloud cover and you were wrong. Um, any any wrap-up thoughts? The central point I should like to leave the panel with is that there is no hurry. If you do nothing about this at all, for the whole of the next 23 years, the worst that will happen using the UN's own estimates, is a one Fahrenheit degree warming, which will be largely harmless and beneficial. So you have plenty of time 
to check the studies, just a few of which I have shown you today in the peer-reviewed literature, suggesting that there is another side to this story, another side based not on modelling but on measurement, which establishes, and it is with increasing clarity establishes, that there is no scientific problem. Even if there were, adaptation as and where and if necessary would be orders of magnitude cheaper and more cost-effective than trying to stop the emission of carbon dioxide. Who is going to get hurt if you start closing down coal-fired power stations, putting up the price of gasoline and electricity? Who is going to get hurt? It is the working people of America. Is that a good thing? I don't think so, and nor should you. We thank uh, each of you for your uh, participation in this very important hearing. We will continue um, uh, with uh, additional hearings on this uh, issue uh, so that we can uh, ensure that all of the science uh, is uh, out in a way that it makes it possible for the public uh, to be able to make an informed uh, decision uh, as to whether or not there really is such a thing as global warming that has been caused by uh, man-made activity. Uh, we think um, that uh, there is no more important debate that we can have in the Congress or, or in our country. Uh, and uh, the experts that we had today, I think, uh, very clearly laid out um, the scientific reality uh, and has only added to my conviction that uh, we have to act and we have to act soon. The Waxman-Markey bill passed last June 26, 2009. The Senate has a bill which, uh, with a little bit of luck, it will begin consideration of uh, in the relatively near future, uh, but uh, time is of the, ex uh, of the essence. So uh, with the thanks of the committee, uh, this hearing is adjourned.